37 Practices of a Bodhisattva is an ancient text written in the 14th century BCE by Topmu Zangpo, a Buddhist monk and scholar who was born in Puljung, southwest of the Sakya Monastery in Tibet. 37 Practices is a beautifully condensed work that makes clear the day-to-day -day behavior of a Bodhisattva, an enlightened being on their way to attaining full Buddhahood, and gives advice on how to emulate this in your own life. It can serve you as a practical guide as you travel the path towards enlightenment. Though short in length, a person could spend a rewarding lifetime perfecting the practices. I respect the beauty and truth of the original text, translated from the original Tibetan, however my greatest wish is to bring the even greater beauty of the underlying message in plain English to the modern world, to people who might otherwise find the original text less than easy to understand. Bringing this ancient text to a 21st century audience in simple, everyday language is part of my effort to free all sentient beings from the cycle of suffering. David Tuffley Redland Bay Australia Practice 1, Grateful to be alive Being in possession of a more or less healthy human body is a great privilege not to be underestimated. Being equipped with such a body and having the time to pursue spiritual enlightenment is an even greater blessing. Being equipped with such an admirable vehicle, let us waste no time. Let us work tirelessly night and day to free ourselves, and all sentient beings from the cycle of suffering. My body is like a great ship that can cross the storm-tossed ocean of samsara. One must listen carefully to one's teachers, consider carefully what has been said, then meditate on this. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, it is easy to take your body and your health for granted. But as normal as it might seem, a healthy body is actually a thing of enormous value in your quest for enlightenment. Even a body with a handicap is a valuable possession. No one, not even someone with an apparently perfect body is actually perfect. We are all born with a handicap of one kind or another, intellectual, emotional and or physical. It is simply a question of degree. Whatever the degree, be grateful for the gift of a body. Since none of us truly know how much longer we have to live, we must waste no time in making progress towards our goal. Practice 2. Solitude. When we stay for a long time in one place we become attached to the people, practices and culture that reside there. We become attached to the people and animals that we love. Our attachment is cause for pleasure and pain which makes for a turbulent life. Sometimes we get angry at those around us, and the anger consumes any merit that we might have accumulated through virtuous living. The darkness and fog created by closed-minded thought, obscures our ability to have insight into what is right and wrong. Living among unenlightened people inevitably causes these problems. Therefore we must leave the society of people and go to a place of peace and solitude and meditate. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, interacting with the world and living with people inevitably leads to forming attachments which keeps you bound to the cycle of suffering. You swing like a pendulum back and forth from pleasure to pain in an endless cycle of drama. Anger is a particularly destructive emotion. It can burn away in a few moments the virtue that has taken years to build up. We become like the people we associate with. Living with closed-minded people makes us likewise closed-minded. Our insight into the nature of right and wrong is obscured by the ignorance that goes with closed-mindedness. Practice 3. Tranquility. After withdrawing from society and that which excites us, our mental disturbances slowly decline, much like ocean waves after a storm. And refraining from the aimless gratification of sensory pleasures, our attention to the accumulation of virtue will naturally increase. As time goes by and our wisdom increases, our perspective on the world becomes clear and objective. Our certainty in the rightness of the Dharma grows. This can only be done in seclusion from the world. One should find a peaceful place far from the madding crowd in which to meditate. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, as difficult as it might be to bring calmness and stability to one's life, once you have removed yourself from interaction with people and society generally, calmness will naturally increase. Your focus on virtue will also increase when you are away from the temptations of the flesh in all of its forms, sex, drugs, entertainment, rich food and intoxicating drink, exciting pastimes of all kinds. 
As hard as it might be to remove yourself from the people and things and places that you love, it is necessary for the one who seeks enlightenment, since enlightenment can only be achieved when you let go of all of your attachments. Practice 4, Non-Attachment No living arrangement lasts forever. Even people who have lived together for decades must one day part. The wealth that we work so hard to acquire must also be left behind, when we depart this life. Our mind is but a driver in the earthly vehicle, that is our earthly body. The driver must one day depart the vehicle. Therefore leave behind all thought of worldly matters, like it is discarded baggage. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary it can be disturbing to think of parting company with people you have lived with for a long time, one's parents, one's children, one's partner or anyone else. It is a small death to be separated from them. It can also be threatening to think that all of the wealth and status that you have acquired in life will someday pass from you to someone else, no matter how hard you hold on to it. It feels like theft. But most precious is your consciousness, the me, myself, I. The thought of dying can be terrifying. Notice that all of these are attachments that a bodhisattva has found a way to let go of. You are beginning to see that the path to enlightenment requires great courage and resolve. It is not easy for anyone. Practice 5, Right Company or No Company By remaining in the company of people who misguide us, though we regard them as friends, our hatreds, desires, attachments and ignorance will grow. Our preoccupation with worldly vices prevents us from meditating on the Dharma. Who could think of virtue when the vice is so attractive? In such a distracted state, we forget our love and compassion for all sentient beings. Cast off your so-called friends who keep you from your Dharma practice. A real friend would encourage you in your efforts, not try to distract back to your accustomed vices. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary the people who keep you from your dharma practice are not your real friends. They are people who you keep company with as they indulge their various vices. They are one's drinking buddies and the like. If you pursue vice instead of virtue, you defer your dharma practice until a tomorrow that never seems to come. The Buddha said if you find an intelligent companion, a wise and well-behaved person going the same way as you, then go along with him, overcoming all dangers, pleased at heart and mindful. But if you do not find an intelligent companion, a wise and well-behaved person going the same way as yourself, then go on your way alone, like a king abandoning a conquered kingdom, or like a great elephant in the deep forest. It is better to travel alone. Practice 6, Mentor The way to enlightenment is to find an enlightened teacher and commit oneself to following his or her advice. Eliminating delusion, the enlightened teacher's virtue increases like the crescent moon becoming fuller with the passage of time. Having found such a teacher and following their advice we can overcome our problems, dispel our delusions and eventually achieve enlightenment. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, it is an age-old principle that a sincere seeker in almost any field of endeavor benefits greatly from being apprenticed to a wise and benevolent master, forming a mentoring relationship. Since the dawn of humanity, knowledge has been passed on this way. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Practice 7, Demi Gods and False Idols The world creates gods and goddesses out of celebrities. They are worshipped by many. Yet these deified people are still fallible and all too human, subject to the same earthly cycle of suffering as everyone else. They are no use when seeking liberation from suffering. They cannot liberate us, they live in the same prison with the rest of us. Take refuge in the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Bodhisattvas. These will never let you down. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, a love of fame and celebrity leads society to create an elite class of people who are held up as an example for others to admire. Across the range of human endeavor, from business, sport, the professions to the arts and the sciences see the beautiful, the wealthy, the clever, the accomplished raised up. Such people achieve a form of deification in the eyes of the world. And yet, even these apparent gods and goddesses have the proverbial feet of clay. Despite the qualities that earned them their celebrity status, they still have their all too human failings. Following the example of these false idols is no way to find enlightenment. 
Following the teachings of Buddha as taught by wise and benevolent teachers is the better way. Practice 8, Doing No Harm The Buddha said that the intolerable suffering of people and animals is a result of negative karma acquired in earlier lives. A wise person therefore avoids harming any sentient being. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary It is widely recognized in various traditions that one should treat others as you would want to be treated yourself. It has been called the Golden Rule, among other names. In physics, the principle is demonstrated in Newton's third law of motion, sometimes called the action-reaction law. Mutual forces of action and reaction between two bodies are equal, opposite and collinear. In other words, what you do to others is done back to you. Therefore, one should endeavor to do no harm. Practice 9, Pursuit of Enduring Happiness Worldly pleasure never lasts for long. It is like the dewdrop poised on the tips of grass in the early morning. It glistens like a jewel when the sun kisses it, but soon it is gone. Our own pleasure lasts but for a short time before it too disappears. Only the bliss of enlightenment endures. Therefore, we should put all our effort into attaining the pleasure that lasts, rather than that which does not. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, nothing in the physical world endures. Everything is subject to decay. Everything is in the process of transforming itself into its own opposite and then back again in a cycle that never ends. Samsara, the cycle of suffering, is an aspect of the physical world. If you identify with earthly things, create an identity based on those things, you will be subject to the cycle of suffering along with everything else in the physical world. The bliss of enlightenment can be experienced, but it is not of this world, therefore it is not subject to change. It makes good sense to put one's efforts towards achieving lasting happiness. The Buddha shows us how. The Bodhisattvas have traveled the path before us. They show us the way. Practice 10, An End to Suffering If we were fortunate as a baby we received tender nurturing love from a parent, who themselves, may have been suffering from all manner of affliction. It seems selfish to seek an end to our own suffering when those who have cared for us still suffer. It is right to seek first to end the suffering of the countless sentient beings in the world, including those who have cared for us. We strive therefore to generate bodhicitta, the enlightened mind, so that we might end the suffering of all sentient beings. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary how can we be truly happy if we are content to see even one person suffer? Only by striving to end the suffering of all sentient beings can we be truly happy. This does not mean that we will not be happy, until all sentient beings are happy. It means that the act and the intention of ending the suffering of others is what brings lasting happiness. Practice 11, Selfless Before Selfish The root cause of suffering is selfishness. If we care only about pleasing ourselves with no thought for the welfare of others, then we will certainly be unhappy much of the time. Conversely, if we think and act with the welfare of others as our priority, then we are on the path to enlightenment and the eventual realization of Buddhahood. So let us exchange our selfish preoccupation with ourselves while people around us suffer with a selfless preoccupation with striving to end the suffering of all sentient beings. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, as the philosopher Daniel Dennett commented, the secret of happiness is to find something more important than you are and dedicate your life to it. What could be a greater cause than to end the suffering of all sentient beings? You could devote your entire life to this worthy cause, and derive enduring happiness along the way. True philanthropy does not draw attention to itself, but goes about its business quietly lest it be perceived as an attempt to buy people's good opinion. Practice 12 two wrongs do not make a right. When someone steals my possessions, or incites others to wrongdoing, we must react with compassion, not condemnation. To these unfortunate people who are gripped by compulsive desires and mental afflictions we dedicate our goodwill. To these unfortunate people we give our bodies, our possessions and our merit. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, in a savage world, anger is met with anger, an eye is taken for an eye, and revenge on those who would harm us is expected. But for you who seek to travel the path of the Bodhisattvas, 
You must transcend these base desires that are more in keeping with the behavior of savage animals. You understand that two wrongs do not make a right. Love is a greater force than hate and will transform it, thus ending the suffering of the hater. Practice 13. Compassion before revenge. When someone hurts us, we must not allow thoughts of hatred or revenge to pollute our sacred inner space. Even when we are beyond reproach ourselves, we do not self-righteously condemn those who would harm us. Our greatest wish for this person is that his suffering be relieved by the spirit of compassion that we manifest. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, this practice is a progression on the previous practice. In both cases you are urged to transcend the base desires of the unevolved mind, to seek revenge against those who would harm you. In this practice, the more serious situation of being physically or emotionally harmed is more provocative than in the previous practice which concerns having your property stolen. Practice 14. Compassion before malice. When someone slanders us with malicious words to harm our reputation in the minds of others, we do not retaliate. Even when others believe the malicious gossip and turn against us, still we do not counter-attack. Our greatest wish is that they will conquer the inner turmoil that has produced their malice and find peace of mind. Instead of criticizing the malicious person, we praise their good points and treat him with kindness. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary as in the previous practices, the way of the Bodhisattva is to always express love and compassion to the world regardless of how the world treats you. To do otherwise is to increase the suffering of the world. So if you are dedicated to relieving the suffering of the world, the only course of action is to treat everyone with love and compassion, especially those who would do you harm in some way. It might be helpful to remember that their malice may not be directed at you personally. Perhaps you remind them of someone else whom they dislike or has done them harm. Perhaps you are simply in front of them when they need to vent their pain. Practice 15, Casting Aside the Ego When someone reveals to the world our past failings, we do not get angry. Even when they parade our present faults to the people whose opinions we most value, we do not get defensive. Instead we listen intently, taking in the words. To this person we bow with respect for he is our teacher. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, the person who takes it upon themselves to point out our faults is a great teacher. It is a matter of perspective. Most people regard negative opinions as a personal attack and react with angry defensiveness or cold indifference. Your ego feels diminished by the criticism and wants to be restored to its former elevated state. Putting your ego aside though, this is probably an opportunity for growth. The fault that has been revealed is likely to be something worth fixing. Practice 16. Compassion before contempt. When someone we have loved and helped, responds with ingratitude and contempt, we do not become bitter. Even when that someone rejects our kindness and treats us like we are their greatest enemy, we understand that their mind is deranged by illness or circumstance. Our greatest wish is to treat them with even more love and affection than before. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, being kind to people should not be conditional on their being kind to us. If you are going to end the suffering of the world you must show leadership in this regard. Indeed, the most ungrateful people are likely to be the ones with the greatest need for kindness. Perhaps they hold a poor opinion of themselves, and do not think they are worthy. Practice 17 humility before contempt. When someone who is our equal expresses contempt for us, we allow the insult to pass. Even when that person is inferior to us, we look on them as a respected teacher who is helping us to conquer our pride. Their arrogance is met with humility. We honor the person who insults us and do not see ourselves as superior. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, we humans are hierarchical by instinct. We naturally form social hierarchies. We have always been like this. So it is that you will be acutely aware of your own place in whatever social hierarchy you live in. Disapproval from a superior, while unwelcome, is likely to be tolerated. Disapproval from your peers or from those lower down in the hierarchy is likely to be met with outrage. How dare they? The way of the Bodhisattva is to step outside of the hierarchy. Hierarchies may have helped our distant ancestors in their struggle to survive, 
but they are no place for the traveler on the path to enlightenment. If you position yourself humbly at the bottom of the hierarchy, your pride will diminish. You will also be perceived as no threat to anyone, a well-intentioned, good-natured person who is kind to everyone. Practice 18, Humility Before Pain When we are reviled by the world as inferior and unworthy, we do not become depressed. Even when we are sick or injured and in pain, we willingly accept these hardships. We courageously endure not only our own suffering but also the suffering of others that they have brought upon themselves through their own actions. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, in this practice you are exhorted to be humble, like water. Water is not proud, it seeks the low places where it quietly nourishes all that is above it. The would-be Bodhisattva not only accepts without complaint the pain and suffering that is the inevitable byproduct of living. You also accept everyone else's suffering, even though they created it themselves through their own ignorance and vice. How else can one end the suffering of the world? Practice 19, Humility Before Adulation When we are praised by the world and treated with deference and respect, we remain humble. Even when we have great wealth and the world calls us by high status titles, we remember that all of this is the illusory fruit of samsara and is not ultimately real. We cast out what pride we might have in these glories. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, praise and status can seduce you into believing you are somehow more worthy than others. Instead of seeking out the lowest place where you can act for the betterment of all, you consider that your place is high up in the social order. Praise is one way that society makes people follow its rules. Blame is the other way. Known as operant conditioning in psychology, when people are rewarded for one kind of behavior and punished for another, they are much more likely to behave in the way that rewards them. In the world of business, this principle is called the great jackass theory of human motivation, otherwise known as the carrot and the stick method. Whatever it might be called, it is important that you have enough objective insight to see that if you play this game, you lose your independence. Someone else is controlling you. If you are traveling the path to enlightenment, you opt out of the social hierarchy by adopting a low status position that is characterized by humility and compassion for all. If you are perceived at all by those above, it will be as a harmless person who poses no threat. Practice 20, Compassion for Your Demons Our inner demons are our most formidable enemy, greater than any outside enemy. Struggling with our demons only makes them stronger, it is not the way to purge them. Until we learn to master our demons they will live on and open the way for negative forces to invade our inner space. These enemies can only be mastered through mercy and love, therefore we work to cultivate compassion. When negativity arises in our mind stream, we are mindful of its rising and immediately neutralize it with love. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary the mental afflictions that derive from unevolved behavior can be neutralized by noticing when they arise, and mindfully replacing them with kindness and a loving attitude generally. The unevolved behavior mentioned here is how our distant ancestors behaved in a savage, uncivilized world. Being proud and competitive, fighting over sexual partners, property and land was once a helpful way to survive in the distant past. Have you noticed how many people still act this way today when it is unnecessary? This might be our instinctive behavior, but it is no help whatever for the one traveling the path to enlightenment. You must transcend this normal behavior and in the process transcend your base self. Identify with your highest self, not your inner caveman. Practice 21, like drinking seawater. Indulging in sensory gratification is like drinking seawater, the more we drink the thirstier we get. The physical world abounds with opportunity and temptation to not only indulge, but overindulge in sensory pleasures. Therefore, when the urge arises we are mindful of its rising and abandon the desire immediately. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, there are thousands of ways that a person can indulge their senses. In a hundred lifetimes you could not experience them all. Indeed, some make it their life's purpose to experience as many pleasures as they can before they die. To them, life is about pleasure and maximum pleasure is their goal in life. You on the other hand recognize that sensory pleasures are like junk food, a sudden flavor burst but with no real value beyond momentary pleasure, 
leaving you with an insatiable appetite for more and blinding you to the deeper possibilities and simple pleasures of the way of the bodhisattvas. Practice 22, The Illusion of Reality Physical reality is an illusion, anything that apparently exists in this world, including our minds, is both unreal and impermanent. The known and the knower do not exist in absolute terms, only in relative terms. The known and the knower are no more or less real than the dream we had last night. So we let go of the cherished notion that the known and the knower are real. We recognize that ultimate reality is formless and beyond this world of appearance. We maintain this awareness every moment of our lives. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, related to the previous practice which counsels against becoming dazzled by the senses, this recommends that you raise your consciousness to go beyond the senses and recognize that what your senses are telling you is an illusion in any case. Furthermore, the you that is receiving information from your senses is also an illusion. How do we know this? Because you will someday perish and disappear, but the ultimate reality behind your egoic self is untouched by death. You must identify not with the egoic you but with your ultimate reality. Practice 23, Beauty is Fleeting when we encounter beauty in the world in any of the thousands of ways that it can appear to us, we remind ourselves that this beautiful object or person is no more real than the rainbow that appears after a summer shower. Both the object and the rainbow seem beautiful, but there is nothing solid behind their appearance. Therefore we are mindful when the compulsive desire to possess the beautiful object arises. We abandon our feelings of attraction and attachment. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, physical beauty can have an overwhelming effect on you. It can make you lose your reason and generate a blind desire to possess it. This is a reaction of the unobserved mind. The traveler on the path of enlightenment controls this urge by reminding him or herself that this beauty is as much an illusion as anything else. How foolish it would be to lose one's head over it. In the light of mindful awareness you dismiss this urge. Practice 24 equanimity before adversity. The adversity that makes us suffer is no more or less real, as real as the nightmare in which a beloved child is killed. To accept as real that which is an illusion is to needlessly subject ourselves to exhaustion of body and mind. Therefore, when adverse events happen, the kind that would normally upset us, we remind ourselves that they are not real and so spare ourselves the pain. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, favorable and unfavorable events in life are deceptive. What appears to be good may turn out to be bad, and vice versa. Consider the lottery winner whose life becomes a torment because of his great wealth, and the wealthy man who loses it all but finds himself in the process. The enlightened person understands that adversity can be a great teacher. Not everything has to feel good, for there to be a benefit embedded somewhere in the experience. Practice 25, Selfless Giving Once we understand what sacrifices are necessary to achieve enlightenment, all other sacrifices seem inconsequential. The gift of human life is the most valuable possession anyone has. So if we are prepared to transcend ordinary human pleasures for the sake of enlightenment, how much easier will it be to let go of possessions and status, titles and glory? So we are generous with no thought of what is owed us in return. Worldly possessions, even one's life, should be freely given. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, sacrificing one's life in this context does not mean suicide. It means letting go of egoic identity, the socially defined self which is an impermanent illusion. It means coming to know our formless, timeless essence as the true self. Selfless giving, or giving with no strings attached is a demonstration of having achieved the proper perspective of the Bodhisattva. Practice 26, Self-Discipline If we are to reach our goal of easing the suffering of all sentient beings, we must have control over our conduct. Without control over one's own behavior, it is absurd to think one can ease anyone's suffering. The root of self-discipline is the renunciation of attachment to pleasure, that which keeps us bound to the wheel of samsara. Upon this foundation of the renunciation of pleasure we build the carefully considered framework of moral behavior that we have committed ourselves to following. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, when people attempt to break free from their addictions and vices, 
and subsequently fail, they often say in their defense, well I tried, I just couldn't do it. This is an admission that they lacked sufficient commitment to make the sacrifice. If you are committed to the Bodhisattva way, you will make whatever sacrifices are necessary to rid yourself of your addictions and vices. Excuses are for the half-hearted. There is a widespread belief in affluent societies that you should not have to endure pain. Life is about maximizing pleasure and avoiding pain. This belief can keep you trapped in bad habits, which is right where our consumer-driven world wants us. The wise traveler on the path understands that no worthwhile undertaking is achieved without some pain, often quite a lot of pain. This is realism, not masochism. We endure not enjoy pain. Practice 27, Cultivating Patience. Travelers on the path to enlightenment welcome adversity as an opportunity to cultivate patience and endurance. Virtue is cultivated through calmly meeting difficulties and mindfully avoiding anger and resentment. Instead, encounters with those who would anger or harm us should be seen as excellent opportunities to learn patience in adversity and how to transcend anger. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary the reaction of the unevolved mind is to hate those who would harm them, and plan some form of retaliation. The eye for an eye principle is still standard practice in many cultures. Likewise, when difficult situations arise, it is all too easy to complain that this should not be happening. The way of the Bodhisattva is to see vexatious people and situations as opportunities to become supremely calm and patient. After all, it is one thing to be calm when all is peaceful and quiet, not so easy when those around you are angry and abusive or in other ways turbulent. You must develop the ability to stay calm and patient in the face of provocation. For example, you may feel calm and relaxed while meditating in the mountains, but how would you feel if you were at the airport and your flight was cancelled indefinitely and the crowd was turning ugly? Practice 28, Endurance on the Path Travelers on the path to enlightenment, whether they travel alone or in like-minded groups, need great discipline to stay on the path. Distractions tempt them to stray, take interesting detours. Since it takes discipline to keep oneself on the path, how much more effort is needed to help all sentient beings onto the path? The attainment of enlightenment demands enormous effort and perseverance. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, the would-be Bodhisattva has a mountainous task ahead of them. You are dedicated to achieving enlightenment for not just yourself, but ultimately for all sentient beings. First things first though, before you can help others you must help yourself. As Gandhi observed, you must become the change you want to see in the world. As you progress along the path, the compassion that leads you to ease the suffering of others will make you into a leader that those people whose lives you touch will want to follow. Practice 29, Tranquility and Insight A tranquil mind, Shamatha, is the necessary foundation upon which insight, Vipassana, can be used to root out and destroy our mental afflictions. Once we have achieved this control, we work in a disciplined way to progress through the four dhyanas. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, each level of the four dhyanas is increasingly peaceful. 1. The first dhyana level is characterized by conception, discernment, joy, physical well-being and samadhi, a state of concentrated awareness in which subject and object merge. It might otherwise be described as an awareness of the unity of all things. 2. The second level is characterized by pristine clarity and alertness in which conceptual thinking is relinquished, bliss, physical well-being and samadhi is experienced. 3. The third dhyana is characterized by perfect composure where the concept of joy is abandoned, one is mindful of the true nature of phenomena. Physical well-being and samadhi is experienced. 4. The fourth dhyana is liberation, enlightenment, a state of the most profound meditative awareness. One's sensual awareness becomes neutral even to the point of abandoning the sense of physical well-being. One is fully mindful and perfectly composed. Samadhi is continuously experienced. Practice 30. The Perfection of Wisdom Perfecting the five virtues, charity, Patience, ethics, devotion and effort will not by themselves suffice. The perfection of wisdom, prajna, is also required. Without this, practicing the five virtues will not be enough to bring us to enlightenment. 
Cultivating wisdom and discernment, bodhicitta, leads us to understand that the actor, the act, and the acted upon are not as real as they appear to be. Their apparent substance is an illusion. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, Prajna is variously described as wisdom, understanding and sharpness of discernment. Prajna exists independently of the human mind that is able to intuitively experience it through meditation. Bodhicitta is the awakened mind whose sole purpose is to attain enlightenment and ease the suffering of sentient beings. It is characterized by the union of compassion and wisdom. Practice 31, Purging Delusion We mindfully analyze our daily conduct for evidence of delusion and mental affliction, sometimes so subtle as to escape notice. We do this in addition to our daily Dharma practice because without this scrutiny we might easily still go astray. Therefore we become ruthless seekers after the truth about ourselves. Let no quirk or bad habit escape notice. Be not attached to any of them, for they are impediments to your spiritual growth. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, if your spiritual practice is not to degenerate into empty formalism, you must systematically scrutinize your thoughts and feelings in real time. Everyone, even highly evolved people, have their faults and these faults are holding them back. To pretend otherwise is an example of the kind of delusion that we should be on the lookout for. Yet these quirks can be difficult to relinquish. They are how we define ourselves in the eyes of the world. Who would you be without them? Will people still like you? Will they reject you? Don't be afraid to relinquish these comforting lies, and don't be afraid of the threats. It is difficult to let our delusions go because the ego feels that its existence is threatened, and with good reason. By ridding yourself of your bad habits and traits, you are killing those aspects your ego. The ego fights hard to preserve itself. Practice 32, The Delusion of Superiority Avoid criticizing others by discussing their supposed faults. To do so is to believe the delusion that we are superior. If those we criticize are later found to be bodhisattvas, we do not harm them, we only harm ourselves. Therefore avoid making disparaging remarks about any who travel on the path to enlightenment, whoever they may be. If we speak of faults, it is only our own faults that we speak of. This is the way of the bodhisattva. Commentary, from idle gossip all the way up to malicious slander, this is the ego's way of defining itself and feeling superior. How can you work towards ending the suffering of all sentient beings when you regard some of them as fools? Rid yourself of the need to feel superior. Criticism of oneself on the other hand can help to diminish the ego. Practice 33, The Dark Side of Affluence If we have a sense of entitlement for wealth, possessions, status, sexual partners, and if we then struggle to acquire these, we shall surely also acquire delusion and affliction. Such a life makes it impossible to contemplate the Dharma and meditate effectively. Our mind is full of turbulent thoughts, resentments, angst and attachment. And look around, are we not surrounded on all sides by this? Therefore remove yourself from environments that encourage or compel the struggle for wealth and status. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary as difficult as it might sound, following the path to enlightenment means leaving much that you currently hold dear behind. Being unencumbered by attachments is the only way that allows you to cultivate the right frame of mind in which to achieve enlightenment. Practice 34, The Corrosive Power of Anger Harsh words said in anger have a very unsettling effect on the minds of those that hear. Those same words also have a corrosive effect on the mind of the person who says them. Such an effect makes our dharma practice difficult to pursue. Therefore, knowing that harsh speech harms everyone concerned, we abandon forever this habit. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, those who would travel the path of the Bodhisattva refrain from all forms of gossip and vulgar speech. They speak in a calm, gentle voice, understanding that anger is like an acid that burns the vessel that contains it. Practice 35 exchanging bad for good. The unevolved mind acts habitually out of base desire. The longer we have the habit, the more established it becomes and the more difficult it is to change. Great effort is needed to change bad habits. Mindfulness is the best strategy to win this struggle. 
Being mindful at all times, we notice and dismiss the base impulse as soon as it arises. In the next instant, we replace it with an attitude of love and compassion. Exchange bad for good, over and over. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary Moment by moment you observe the flow of consciousness in your mind. When an impulse arises, you notice its rising. For example, if you see an attractive person, your base impulse might be to imagine being intimate with them. Instead of indulging in a fantasy that arouses your passion, you immediately dismiss the impulse. See the attractive person simply as another human being worthy of respect, not as an object of self-gratification. The same applies when someone offends your dignity. Don't allow yourself to feel angry. The important thing is to constantly monitor what is happening in your mind, and habitually choose to feel love and compassion for all beings regardless of what your unevolved impulses might urge you to do. Know that you have control over them and consciously exercise that control. Practice 36, Consciousness Awakening. Practice moment by moment self-awareness to observe your state of mind at all times. In this mindful way, consciously choose to act and react with love and compassion to whatever happens. Thus we overcome our base nature and work towards the welfare of all sentient beings. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary Cultivate a new dimension of consciousness which monitors what you are thinking at all times. There is the I that thinks your regular thoughts, and there is the higher entity that observes this flow of thinking in a detached way. To use a computer metaphor you have installed a monitoring program. This is no mere program though, this is a higher state of mind that is consciousness awakening to itself. Having this metacognitive awareness is essential to your spiritual growth. It is this higher self that practices true free will. Being fully conscious, it is capable of exercising choice. If you operate with the unobserved mind only you are likely to react unconsciously in instinct-driven ways to what happens to you. You are not exercising choice unless you are fully conscious. When you are fully conscious, you see the cause and effect linkages between what happens in the environment and what you decide to do about these events. Instead of blindly reacting, you consciously choose a course of action that will produce good outcomes. This is how to engineer a good life. Practice 37, Ending the Suffering of All Sentient Beings All of the virtue that we gain through our Dharma practice we use to generate wisdom and an enlightened mind. Our developing wisdom and enlightenment we dedicate to ending the suffering of all sentient beings. The world of appearances and all the sentient beings in it are an illusion. The ultimate truth is unspeakably blissful. We dedicate ourselves to achieving that bliss for all sentient beings. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. Commentary, what you do, you do not do for yourself. You do it for all sentient beings, of which you are but one. Being enlightened means exchanging your egoic identity for an infinitely greater knowing that you are one with the universe and all that is within it. Epilogue After years of careful study and attention to the teachings of my gurus, I, Topan Zangpo, have written this modest little book of 37 short chapters. It faithfully represents the truth of the sacred teachings handed down by the Buddhas and Masters of old. I have done this to help all those who sincerely seek enlightenment and wish to follow the path already traveled by the Bodhisattvas who have gone before. This book is not written in polished literary language that scholars would approve of. Rather it is written in plain language for anyone to read. But I have made sure that everything I have said is absolutely consistent with what my gurus have taught me. I have faithfully described what the Bodhisattvas have done. It is possible that my limited intellect has not comprehended the full depth and subtlety of the Bodhisattva's conduct. If I have failed to fully understand, I beg the indulgence of my gurus. Please forgive my shortcomings. With the pure light of the enlightened mind that perceives the void yet is loving and compassionate, may the virtue I have gathered be used for the benefit of all sentient beings. O great Loksvara, embodiment of compassion, may we reach your attainment.